Okay, everyone, I hope you're going to be able to hear me. I'm doing this at school and there's some extra noise, so I will try to talk a little bit louder. Um, the chapter four test is either Thursday or Friday next week, January 23rd or the 24th. Um, I'll do a study session that Saturday. It is a three day weekend, but the building is open. So we'll do nine to 11 and let's begin. So looking at your study guide, it says to factor the following expression. So if you're wondering, oh wow, I don't remember how to do all of this. There are some math notes on in lesson 4.1.4. If you pull up your ebook, you go to that lesson, kind of at the end of the lesson are some math notes on factoring quadratic expressions. So a lot of people will say, oh, just do the area diamond model. Yes, that is what you're doing, but I would like you to call it factoring a quadratic. So remember, we put the x squared term and the constant in opposite corners. And we use the diamond just to figure out these missing pieces. So all of this is based on using tiles. If I had tiles, and I had three x squared tiles, and I had eight unit tiles, and 10 x tiles, where would I put the 10 x tiles? How would I split them up so that this becomes a rectangle? That's why we use this model. So we're looking for two terms that when I multiply them, I get 24 x squared, for example, on this one, because we notice that when you multiply the diagonals, the cross products are equal. And because I know I have 10 x tiles, I know I need to split them up so that they multiply to this top number and add up to the bottom number. So let's do the first one. And I purposely, <clears throat> trying to save a little paper here, I did not do these, um, make a lot of room for you to do these on the study guide. So do these in your notebook. <clears throat> So I'm going to draw an area model and a diamond. My x squared term and my constant, the constant is the one without a variable, go in opposite corners. So this is going to be negative 12x squared and then my x term goes on the bottom. If I were building this with tiles, I would have an x squared term here, I would have 12 negative unit tiles here, and I would have a total of one x tiles here, which means I might have some positive tiles and some negative tiles to come up with a total of one x tile right here. So I'm looking for factors of, remember this is the product, this is the sum, um, and it, we do use product and sum twice when we're doing these problems. This is actually the sum, and we're going to write it as a product. Um, so I'm looking for factors of negative 12 that add up to positive 1. That 1 is not written. If there's nothing in front of x, the coefficient is 1. So that's got to be 4 and 3. So 4x and 3x, and because I want them to multiply to give me negative 12 but add up to positive 1, I know that 3 has got to be a negative. So that's going to be four x tiles here and three negative x tiles here. And then I'm going to find the length and the width of this rectangle. x times x is x squared. x times negative three is negative three x. x times positive four is positive four x. So as a product, this would be <coughs> x minus 3 and x plus 4. You could also write 4 plus x. You know, it doesn't have to be in this order. Okay, hopefully you feel confident about those. If you need more practice, factoring quadratics intro is a great assignment from Khan. You could just search that up. A round of those to like remember. Um, it's been a little while and that would be great practice. Okay, number two. Okay, we've got x squared plus 5x. <coughs> so remember, standard form of a quadratic expression 
is ax squared plus bx plus c. That's standard form. So what's missing? The constant term is missing, so I'm going to put a zero for whatever is missing. And then just do the same process we did for all of our other expressions. So let's make an area model. <coughs> and a diamond. My x squared term and my constant go in opposite corners. And I multiply these to get 0x squared. I could just put 0. Um, I'm multiplying. Remember, we noticed that this product and this product were the same. That was just something that we noticed. And we said, OK, well, if I can multiply these and get the same product as when I multiply these, but I know I have to have 5x tiles to use here, then my diamond is the perfect way to figure out what those missing terms are. So 5x is my total. That's my sum. 0x squared is my product. Well, if my product is 0, I know one of those terms has to be 0. So 0 times what would give me 0x squared, but when I add it, I get 5. I know one of them's got to be 0. You could put 0 or you could put 0x. And then when I add 0 plus 5, I get 5x. So this must be 0x and 5x. And then I'm going to figure out my dimensions, my length and my width. So x times x is x squared. x times 5 is 5x. x times 0 is 0x. So my dimensions would be x plus 0 and x plus 5. This is the sum, the quadratic expression written as a sum, and then this is the product. <coughs> okay, moving along, let's look at number 3. Okay, number 3. We've got 2x squared minus 17x plus 30. Um, and by the way, I will have those notes um, posted in the room. I may just give you these uh, notes that are already in plastic sleeves and put them on each table. So you would have this to look at if you needed a refresher. Um, that's not to say you shouldn't practice with these till you don't need this. I don't want you to be trying to figure it out on the day of the test. Okay, and then this problem, I made some notes called factoring out a common factor. So the greatest common factor is um, of each term is what you're going to factor out. You're going to divide each term by that factor. And on con, it was pretty much always this coefficient, the coefficient of x squared on the test, it will pretty much be the same thing. So what goes into 2, 17, and 30? Oh, you know what? Actually, this one doesn't have a common factor. I take that back. This one's just plain old uh, Um So let's just do an area diamond. I don't have a common factor for 2, 17, and 30. Okay, so 2x squared and 30 in opposite corners. That's going to give me 60x squared when I multiply these. Negative 17x on the bottom. So I'm looking for factors of 60 that add up to 17. So you'll have the multiplication chart. Um, let's see, I'm looking for factors of 60 that are going to add up to 17. So I know what this is off the top of my head. If you didn't, you could use this to figure it out. And I see that this has got a little bit of a glare. Let's just take that out. So 5 times 12 is 60. And if I add 5 and 12, I'm going to get 7 
18. So I know it's going to be 5 and 12, 5x and 12x, but they're not both going to be positive because I want them to multiply to give me positive 60, but I want them to add up to negative 17. So that means they both need to be negative. So negative 5x times negative 12 is positive 60. Negative 5x plus negative 12 is negative 17. Let's get our length and our width. Now here, I know it's going to be 2x and x, but the 2 has to go here because 2 is a factor of this, these two terms. 2 is not a factor of these two terms. So 2x has to go here and then x here. 2x times what is negative 12? x times what is negative 5? And then negative 6 times negative 5 is positive 30. So as a product, this would be x minus 6 and 2x minus 5. Okay, number 4 is the one that's going to have the common factor. So 4 is 3x squared plus 18x plus 24. Okay, now actually before I draw my area model, Let's factor out that common factor. So these are the notes I was telling you about. You will have this, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't practice with this a little bit on con. Maybe do one round of factoring quadratics with a common factor. You don't want to be trying to figure something out on the day of the test. You want to feel like, oh, I remember this. This is easy. Okay, so we're going to factor out the common factor. What goes into 3, 18, and 24? 3. So I'm going to divide each of these by 3, which is going to give me x squared plus 6x plus 8. Whoops, plus 8. Now, there's a danger in doing this and writing the 3 right here. Sometimes people forget to put the 3 out here. We have factored it out. It didn't just disappear. We just rewrote 3x squared plus 18x plus 24 with the common factor in front. That is part of your answer. So you can't just not write that 3. You will lose points if you leave that off. Okay, now I'm going to do my area model and my diamond to figure out the missing pieces of that model. So x squared and 8. So this is going to be 8x squared. 6x on the bottom. What can I multiply to get 8? But when I add it, I get 6. So that's 4x times 2x is 8x. 4x plus 2x is 6x. Okay, so my length and my width would be x plus 2 and x plus 4. And then that 3 is a factor, so that's factored completely. Remember I, um, I think it was Khan uh, said to factor completely. So if you just did this, you're not done. Okay, moving on to number five. Five is a difference of squares. And I had made some notes, and you'll have these on the day of the test. Remember a difference of squares. We did a big activity where we had like strips of paper and we just noticed the pattern and we moved them around on the board. But basically if you see two perfect squares and they are, one is being subtracted from the other, we saw the pattern was, oh, this is just going to factor into the square root of the first term plus the square root of the second term, a plus b, times the square root of the first term minus the square root of the second term. Why does that work? Here's why it works right here. If you do a plus b times a minus b, a times a is a squared, a times negative b is negative ab, a times positive b is positive ab, and then negative b times positive b is negative b squared. So the positive ab and the negative ab wind up canceling each other out 
and you wind up with a squared minus b squared. So there's some examples here, um, some with a coefficient of 1, some with a coefficient that's a perfect square. Um, if you are feeling shaky on this, um, con difference of squares, do some practice with that assignment, search it up. You probably have done it already. Maybe you actually legitimately did it. Maybe you used your phone. I know what you guys are up to, um, but go ahead and practice with that. You're not going to have your phone on the day of the test. Okay, so let's do... Twenty-five x squared minus 36. This is a perfect square. Remember your perfect squares would be 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, and so on. All of the highlighted numbers are my perfect squares. So 25 is a perfect square and 36 is a perfect square. So I know this is going to be a difference of two squares. I'm going to write this out step by step. This is a squared minus b squared. I know it's going to factor into a plus b times a minus b. You don't have to do area diamond. If you want to, you can. And if you want, I, could, I might just show you how to do it really quickly. But on the test, if you don't, I will not take off points on this one. So the square root of this term is 5x. The square root of this term is 6. So I know this is going to factor into 5x plus 6, 5x minus 6. If you don't understand that, it, if you do understand that, if you're okay with it, you can skip over this next little part. I'm going to quickly write it out with a 0 in the x, um, in place of the x term. Let's see, where did I write? And I wrote standard form somewhere. Well, now I don't see it. Okay, standard form is ax squared plus bx plus c. So I'm putting a zero for the term that's missing. If I did area diamond with this, I would have some very large numbers. That's why it's good to know the pattern here. Okay, 25, what's 25 times 36? Okay, that's 900, in this case negative 900, x squared, and it's going to add, now if you're pretty strong with your multiplication, you might just be able to figure this out. If you got stuck using the pattern, you know these two numbers have to be the same if you're multiplying and getting a negative, but you're adding and getting zero. So this is going to be 30, positive 30x, and negative 30x. So then my length and width, 5x times 5x is 25x squared. 5x times negative 6 is negative 30. 5x times positive 6 is positive 30. So you could do it the long way and possibly, whoops, that was not even on the screen, possibly figure that out. Um, okay, moving on to number 6. We're going to start doing a few problems using trig. And if you are looking for some guidance here, we've got some math notes on... Oh, and by the way, um, you know what? There's no perfect squares, perfect square trinomials on the test now that I look at that. So you don't have to worry about that one. Um, but you do have some math notes on, in lesson 422 if you are trying to remember your steps for trig. I'm probably going to make a poster with the sentence stems and all the steps, but these math notes have tangent, sine, cosine, shows you how to get that opposite side, um, and it's got some good um, reminders in there. So 422 would be some math notes for trig ratios. Um, this tends to throw some people off, this symbol right here. Let me draw this and then...
It's the Greek letter alpha. It's just like beta, it's just another variable. Um, and we are solving for x. We're writing an equation to solve for x. So we just go through our steps. Step one, arc on the angle. Step two, draw your arrow across from that angle. That's your opposite. Step three, label your hypotenuse and your adjacent. Then you do your sentence stems. I have, I need. In this case, I have my hypotenuse. I need my opposite. So I look at my ratios, which one has hypotenuse and opposite. Hypotenuse and opposite would be sine. Sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So I set this up using sine. Sine alpha equals and I know sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse, so I'm gonna put x over 57. I always write this on the side so that I put everything in the right spot. Now, this is a little strange because you're not used to having a, a, a variable right there and, not ha and having another variable. There's two variables, so you're not finding an answer to this. You're just setting up an equation to solve for x. So when I cross multiply, I get one times x is x. 57 times sine of alpha is my answer. That's it, that's as far as you can go. Okay, I went through those steps kind of fast, but um, you'll have a poster and hopefully by now you have really mastered this. If not, guess what? Con these two assignments. This one will help you with just picking out what sine, cosine, and tangent are. This will help you in, in the process. That this, these are just more like the ones we just did. The only thing is you do need a calculator for this because Khan will not accept an expression. It wants the decimal answer. So those are good ones to practice. Okay, number seven. We're going to find x and y in this triangle. So we're basically, there's two problems here. It's not just one. Okay, number seven. Okay, step one, arc on the angle. Step two, draw the arrow across from the angle. That's my opposite. Label my hypotenuse and my adjacent. Hypotenuse is always my longest side across from the right angle, which leaves the remaining side as your adjacent. Sentence stems, I have, I need. I have my hypotenuse. I need my adjacent, I could start with adjacent or opposite here. Hypotenuse and adjacent is cosine, and the cosine is always the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So I'm gonna set this up with cosine. Cosine, 28 degrees equals, cosine is my adjacent over my hypotenuse. So that's going to be x over 20. Put a 1 under cosine 28, cross multiply, and you get x equals 20 cosine 28 degrees. I'm fine with you leaving it like that. Now we have to do this again because we also have to solve for y. Okay, so I'm going to do I have and I need, but this time I'm going to say I need my opposite. I could use the adjacent here, but I'm going to just stick with the hypotenuse. I have my hypotenuse. I have 20. So hypotenuse and opposite is sine, and sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So sine 
of 28 degrees equals my opposite over my hypotenuse. Remember, if you don't skip these steps, it is going to almost guarantee that you get it correct. So my opposite is y. My hypotenuse is 20. Cross multiply. <coughs> Put a 1 under here. Cross multiply. y equals 20 sine 28 degrees. There we go. Okay, number eight, we've got a word problem. A street slopes upward at an angle of 17 degrees with the horizontal. How high does it rise over a horizontal distance of 130 meters? Explain your thinking that you use to arrive at your answer. Draw a diagram of the situation. Okay, street slopes upward. There's our street, and this angle at which it is sloping upward, the angle of elevation is 17 degrees with the horizontal. Horizontal like the horizon. All of these are right triangles. And if you want more practice, there's a con assignment, right triangle word problems. You do have to be able to find the angle, which is another assignment in order to do this one. But it is great practice and I think you'll see this on PSAT. Okay, um, how high does it rise? There you go, right there in the question. How high does it rise? I'm looking for the rise, the change in y. Um, over a horizontal distance of 130 meters. Okay, so let's do our steps. Arc on the angle. All of these are oriented like slope triangles. That does make life a little easier. This is my opposite. This is my hypotenuse. This is my adjacent. So I have adjacent, I need my opposite. Adjacent and opposite is the tangent ratio. It's one we started out with. It's the rise and the run, it's the slope. So let's set this up using tangent. So tangent. 17 degrees equals tangent is the opposite over the adjacent, so it's going to be y over 130. Put a 1 under tangent 17 degrees, cross multiply, so 1 times y, 130 tangent 17 degrees. There you go. Okay, I am moving quickly because I need to get ready for our class. Um, number nine, we saw some problems like this in checkpoint number four. Um, I do expect you to draw the triangle separately. If you don't, I am going to take off points. So let's draw these triangles separately. Here's the big triangle. And here's the little triangle. I'm going to add everything here. And I, mm, mm, oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay, uh, let's see. 7 plus 17.5 is, I don't know why I'm using a calculator right now, 24.5 for, for the big triangle. And then the little one, 17.5. And then this would be um, 15.75. This angle is shared, and if I do, I didn't do that right, huh? This is 11.25, and this is 15.75. Okay, if I were to divide 11.25 by gives me point, it's about 0 0.71, and if I do 17.5 um, divided by 24.5, hopefully I did that right. Okay, that's also 0 0.71. So the reason we know these are similar, these are similar by side angle side. When you have an angle that's shared 
and because these are overlapping, they share this angle. And you have the sides that include that angle are in proportion, so this divided by this is the same as this divided by this. That means this is a dilation of this. So this SAS is a shortcut for similarity. We're not just making an assumption that these are similar. So to find this missing side, I'm gonna set up a proportion you could use a scale factor and do it that way, that's fine. Just show me what you do on the calculator. So I'm gonna set up a proportion just because that's how we did it on the homework. Let's see, I'm gonna write, do this. Okay, so then I know whatever I do to 11.25 to get 15.75. I'm going to do the same thing. This is my small triangle, and this is my large triangle. Maybe write that down so you get your numbers in the right spot. I'm going to do the same thing to 9 to get x. Or another way to say that is 11.25 is to 15.75 as 9 is to x. I'm going to cross multiply, so I'm going to do 9 times 15.75. And that is 141.75 equals 11.25x. Um, and then I'm going to divide both sides by 11.25. And that is 12.6. Um, could you just divide these, get the scale factor, and use that and multiply it by 9? Yes, I am fine with that. As long as you just show me what you did, just jot all of that down on your paper, that's fine. Um, number 10, same kind of problem. Okay, I am going to sketch this and then I can use this copy. So in this triangle, I've got vertical angles that are congruent. And then I have a bunch of sides. Let's see, 7, 7.54, 27, 9.25. Uh, this is 51 degrees. This is 81 degrees. Oh, you know what? Let's go ahead. Okay, this is 48. This is 48. Let's find that missing angle. So let's just quickly do that. So I'm going to do... 51 plus 48 plus x equals 180 to get that missing angle. That's going to be 99 plus something equals 180. So then subtract 99 from 180, x is 81. So this is 81. So that means that this angle matches this angle. This angle matches this angle, so this must be 51 degrees. So then these two triangles are similar by angle angle and I can set up a proportion. I know that this is just a dilation of this. So let's set up a proportion. Be careful when you are doing this um, that you match up the right sides. So I'm going to start with 9.25 and 27. 9.25 is across from, in my mind I'm doing this, I see it's across from 81 and so 81 over here is across from 27, so I know these two sides must correspond. Another way to do that is to just use some tracing paper and trace Trace all the dimensions here and make sure you've got the right sides matching up. So 9.25 corresponds to 27. So I'm going to start with that. 9.25 is to 27 as, now this was from the triangle on the left. Be careful, if you mix these up, then you get the whole thing wrong. So I'm going to, I'm trying to figure out what X is. 7 is across from 48. 
x is across from 48. 7 is on the left, so that goes on the top. x goes on the bottom. And then just cross multiply and divide. So let's see, 27 times 7 divided by 9.25 is about 20.4. Okay, hopefully these are going to be easy points. Um, then we have number 11. And um, the best thing to do if you are struggling with this is to um, work on checkpoint number Four. If you go to the back of the book, checkpoint number four has examples and the homework assignments from last week, those would also be good to press. Okay, so it says given PEA is similar to NUT, what's the length of EA? So I'm looking for EA, which means I need to figure out what X is. So I am going to use the fact that PE corresponds to NU. I see PE is first and U is first, so I know 7 corresponds to 21 now. We know that's a scale factor of 3, right? So I could just use that to figure this out. Whoops, not 7 over 3. 7 over 21. 7 is to 21 as, now I could go with EA and UT. I know those correspond, or I could go with PA and NT. Either way, you're going to get the right answer. Um, so EA is X plus 8, and then UT is 4X plus 4. Now this is, looks a little bit harder than the others. If this is complicated, I can show you quickly another way of doing it. Um, that's going to give me 7 times 4X plus 4, 21 times X plus 8 which would give me 28x plus 28 equals 21x plus uh, 168. There's x's on both sides. Get rid of the smaller one. So minus 21x on both sides. So 168 equals 7x plus 28. Solve for x. Subtract 28 from each side. and then divide by 7, so x equals 20. Now, if that was complicated, you I'll show you another way in a second. Okay, I'm looking for EA. EA is x plus 8, so then EA would be 20 plus 8. Now, you could, and I, I'm, I know the one on the test is easy enough where you could do this, you could just say, I know the scale factor is 3. So I know if I do 7 times 3 and I get 21, I'm going to do 3 times this. And that's going to give me this. So if that makes life a little bit easier, just do it that way. Or 3 times this, 3 times x plus 6 is going to give me 4x minus 2. And there's no tricks with this being oriented differently than this. You don't really need to do the whole similarity statement ratios process. So let's see. If we do that, we get 3x plus 24 equals 4x plus 4. x is on both sides. Subtract 3x from both sides. So x plus 4 equals 24. Subtract 4, x equals 20. Get the same thing. So whatever way makes the most sense. Um, this is your first test of the semester. Make sure that you put time into preparing for it so that you start the semester off with a great grade.